Christmas is coming. And some of you hate me right now for saying that because it's still September. But let me just give you a friendly reminder that um, in the Bible, hate is equivalent to murder in God's eyes. So there's that. But also time is moving so fast right now that Christmas will actually be here before we know it. Now, most of you know, if you've been a part of the River Church for any amount of time, that I love Christmas. Uh, one of my favorite things during Christmas to do is to watch Hallmark movies. And yes, I am fully aware that they all have the same plot. They all end the same way, happily ever after. But I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, sure, it's not normal to always experience that in real life. But here's the thing. If you read the Bible, what you will see is that God promises that one day for his people, those who have turned from their sin and put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, that one day there will be a happily ever after. Therefore, I think it's okay to be a fan of Hallmark movies that normalize happily ever after because truthfully, it's something that God says will be normal in the future. Well, my intention for starting off today with speaking about that isn't to go into speaking about Santa, but really just to warm us up for a conversation on spiritual things. Now, we are currently in a series on recalibration. It's based on our 2023 vision of spiritual maturity. We believe God is calling our church to grow up. And in order to do that, we got to get back to the basics. We need to recalibrate, or in other words, we need to make sure that we are caring about the same things that Jesus cares about. And today I am going to talk about the supernatural and how it needs to be a normal part of our Christian lives. And to prove this, I'd like to take us on a journey through the scriptures, specifically the book of Acts, the story of the early church, which is a good place for the modern church to examine ourselves to determine if we need recalibration. And just a warning, we are going to read a lot of scripture today, but that is actually a good thing. So first off, we're going to read about miracles like signs and wonders and healings. Then we're going to look at things like visions and supernatural knowledge or prophecy. Finally, we will discuss something that's called spiritual warfare. And we are only going to scratch the surface of these subjects, but don't worry. If you have an interest in these kind of things, we are going to discuss them in more depth later this month when we begin the Gifts of the Spirit series. That being said, let's dive in. So first off, let's talk about miracles, like signs, wonders, and healings. Now, I admit that this is a difficult subject. Considering miraculous things in our very scientific culture can even seem silly. Even within the church, there is disagreement about the miraculous. You know, sometimes this dis disagreement is sourced from an improper affection for miracles, which Jesus himself warned us about. And sometimes there's disagreement that comes from even solid Christians who believe the miraculous things aren't for today. Now, obviously, I believe they are for today. I believe they should be normal. That's why I'm talking about it today. But I also believe that there is room for disagreement. Now, some of you may not agree with what I'm going to say today, and let me just say, that's okay. Here at the River Church, uh, there are certain biblical stances that we are firm on. Things that, like, like Jesus is God, or the inerrancy of Scripture, or Jesus is the only way to be saved. We are firm on those things. As I've said before in this series, we care about the things that Christ cares about. However, there are secondary biblical issues that are open to different interpretations and disagreement. And differences, in my mind, are okay. Even within our leadership team here at the River Church, there are differences on secondary beliefs. Yet, we still exist in both unity and love. And I think that's healthy. And if it's not clear, 
where I'm going with this is your perspective on miracles can fall into the category of secondary beliefs. So again, if you disagree with me today, as long as what you believe is biblical, that's okay. So here's what I have to share about miracles based on my studies. Again, I believe that miracles are for today. And I believe that when they are experienced, it, 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 it accomplishes the following. When we experience miraculous things, it displays God's power. It reminds us that someone greater than us exists. Someone who is not subject to the natural laws which they created and we are limited by as created beings. Also, when we experience the miraculous, it reminds us that God is present. That there is someone who is greater than us, who has greater authority, and that person is with us. That person is in control even when we don't comprehend what's going on. And finally, when we experience the miraculous, it gets our attention and confirms things that God wants revealed. It says, this is true. This is real. Or it, it supernaturally shakes us up to pay attention or to be careful or to be warned. And so let's look at a few examples that we find in scripture. Acts chapter 3 says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask for alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Now, the beggar is hopeless at this point. He, he needs help, daily help, just to survive, just to beg. We're not even talking about this person even thinking about thriving or living with a joyful purpose. That seemed impossible. But then we go on to read verse 4, And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate at the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. A miracle has happened. The impossible has happened. He is supernaturally healed. Now let's read another story. Acts chapter 5 says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. I want us to think about the words that are used here, and there's a word that's translated regular, and the sense is these signs and wonders, these miracles, were normal. Verse 13 says, Now none of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed." Okay, let's be honest. For many of us, this stuff sounds crazy. I mean, miracles being so normal that people even thought that Peter's shadow could change their lives. Now, whether or not that was true, the sense is it was normal for everyone to experience miracles. Now let's jump forward into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, 
and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, I'm not saying that the the passage I just read is prescriptive, meaning I'm recommending that's how we do things, that we should all start handkerchief ministries. But what I am saying is miracles occurred often in the early church. In the book of Acts, miracles, signs, wonders, and healings were normal. Now, let's move on to another supernatural subject, visions and prophetic knowledge. Again, this is a tricky subject. There is complexity to this. People have often discounted visions and prophecy because they are somewhat subjective and not scientific. Other times, because people have treated them unbiblically, maybe even abusing people or manipulating people by them, it it then causes this polarizing reaction resulting in many discounting or discontinuing these supernatural things. Wherever you currently stand, I want us to just take a moment to look at the scriptures and then listen to how the Holy Spirit might speak to us about these things. And so in Acts chapter 16, Paul is on his second missionary journey. He's visiting the churches that he helped start on his first journey. And then he goes to Derby and then Lystra. And upon deciding where to go next, it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to uh, Mysia, They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they they went down to Troas. Now, I I wonder how many, and yes, I I probably pronounced some of those words wrong, but I, I wonder how many of us would have continued with Paul at this point. I mean, Paul's like, hey guys, let's go this way. Oh, wait, the Holy Spirit said we're forbidden to go over there. All right, let's go this way instead. And so then they travel 200 miles, stop, wait. And then Paul again is like, "Uh, guys, the spirit of Jesus said we can't go that way either. So instead, let's go 200 miles in this way. Most of us would have gone home. We would have been like, oh, the Holy Spirit said no again. Sure, Paul. You know what? Just admit it. You're lost or more likely you're crazy. But then it goes on to say, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so apparently now Paul is like, hey, guys, I had this vision at night and a guy, uh, he said, come over and help us. So let's jump on a boat and go 150 miles in that direction. I mean, most of us would have been like, no, we're out. But the scriptures say that the people who were with Paul in the early church, they didn't leave him. They followed Paul, who was being led supernaturally by something like visions, by the Spirit. Now, earlier in Acts, we come across this story. And at this, uh, the story that I'm about to share. Now, now, at this time, the church was flourishing and people were sharing everything as they lived in biblical community. And one man named Barnabas even sold his field and gave all the money to the church. But, and, and then his generosity was celebrated. And the story continues, but a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. He died. And and great fear came upon all who heard of him. 
you know, this couple, they could have kept their land. They could have kept as much money as they wanted, or they could have given as much as they wanted. The problem was, is they decided to lie because what they really wanted was the personal recognition. Their gift had nothing to do with loving God or loving people. And while that is a sermon all in itself, here's what I want us to consider. How did Peter know that they did that? Well, the answer is the Holy Spirit told him. He got supernatural knowledge. And some of us call this prophecy. Now, that might be confusing because the Bible does use words like prophets or prophecy in a variety of ways. And some of them are overlapping in function and uses. And so sometimes when we hear prophecy, some of us think of like Elijah or one of the Old Testament prophets who authoritatively spoke for God, and some of their words are recorded in God's eternal word. Now, other of us hear that word or that phrase, and we think about predicting the future, like accurately foretelling what will happen. And while both of those things are part of prophecy, prophecy also includes what we can call forthtelling. That is, a making public of knowledge that was only acquired supernaturally by divine revelation, meaning by God's wisdom, he gave someone that knowledge. And in Acts chapter 5, as the church is just getting started, God isn't playing. He wasn't going to let the foundation of his church be built on lies. And so he supernaturally gave Peter Knowledge which resulted in Peter making very serious decisions that produced these extreme consequences. Here's what I'd like for us to consider. Are we, like Paul, willing to be led supernaturally? Or are we willing to, like Peter, receive instruction and even discipline that comes from supernatural revelation? Because this appears to be normal in scripture. And if it's normal then, why not now? I mean, are we more willing to be led by Siri than by the spirit of Jesus? Finally, let's discuss spiritual warfare. Now, in all the best ways, I can say that I am ridiculously busy this past year. Needless to say, I I don't have much free time. And so I don't do a lot of things like watch a lot of movies or shows. However, recently I have begun to watch Survivor. Now Survivor is currently in its 44th season. The first show came out in the year 2000, yet I had never watched a single episode, but recently I decided to check it out and I kind of got hooked. Now, one of the aspects of this show involves voting people off of your tribe and everybody's kind of trying to survive in these, in in, in the wild, in in, in these tropical places. And, 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 And sometimes what happens is what we call a blind side. And that's when somebody gets voted off and they had no, like it was a surprise. They had no idea it was gonna happen. And all of a sudden, they find themselves out of the game. You know, unfortunately, blindsides happen to us in the church too. Many times we forget about or we don't even consider spiritual warfare and then we get blindsided. And in a nutshell, spiritual warfare involves remembering that there is a spiritual realm in our world that is completely real, even if it's unseen. And for our modern culture, one that is hyper-focused on what we can see, ignoring spiritual things is normal. But that wasn't the case in Scripture. Check it out. Ephesians 6 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I want us to notice three things about the passage that I just read. Number one, the devil is just as real as God. Number two, many times we fight battles 
with physical resources when they are actually sourced from spiritual problems. And number three, there is spiritual darkness that is trying to destroy us. And we see this reality in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16 says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. I have to pause for a moment because for whatever reason, this kind of stuff is both popular and acceptable in the community that we live in, in, in my community. Like we won't believe in the spiritual or miraculous parts of, let's just say, biblical faith, but we will participate in divination or spirit gardens or fortune telling. And so just so you know, we're reading about that kind of stuff here in the Bible. And I just want to point out that that stuff is real, it's dangerous, and it's demonic. And so don't play with that stuff because it will destroy you. Verse 17, she followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And so as the book of Ephesians teaches, Paul's problem with this other person was due to something deeper. It was sourced from spiritual darkness. And so he cast out that demonic spirit. Now, a couple of chapters later, we read the following story. Acts chapter 19, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, oh, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, I share these stories to show us something. To show us that according to the scriptures, spiritual warfare is real and it was a normal thing. It is a normal thing. And it needs to be a normal part of our reality because what we need to understand is that many times the depression and the anxiety we feel is really spiritual darkness. That sometimes the hurtful and broken relationships we experience are because of spiritual darkness. And sometimes the circumstances that keep us busy, oppressed, or distracted so much of all that stuff that keeps us from drawing close to God, whether that might be a boyfriend or a girlfriend or work or sports or money or any other normal pursuit in this life, many times those things are connected to spiritual darkness. There is a spiritual battle that's happening. And the only way to fight spiritual warfare is to use spiritual solutions. And one reason why many of us continue to live spiritually defeated is because we keep trying to fix spiritual problems with physical solutions because we do not acknowledge, we do not consider spiritual warfare. And then the devil just laughs at us. 2 Corinthians says, Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Now, in this passage, Paul is specifically talking about unforgiveness. Like, when we don't forgive people, that is actually a scheme of the devil, and it keeps us and other people in spiritual bondage. But unforgiveness isn't his only scheme. The devil has many schemes. And let me just put it this way. If you're part of the River Church family, you'll recognize the phrases that I'm about to say. But think of it this way. Anything that keeps us from loving Jesus, building community, and bringing gospel joy, though, anything that keeps us from that, those are likely schemes of the devil. And the only way that you're going to realize that is if you make it a normal practice to consider the impact of spiritual warfare on your life. 
So the question is, do we consider spiritual warfare a normal part of life? Because what I believe we find here in the book of Acts is that they did. They thought that miracles were normal. They thought that vision and prophecy was was normal and spiritual warfare was normal. And I'd like to suggest today that if they are not normal for us, we may need to recalibrate. What's, what's the purpose of experiencing supernatural things? So before we close, I, I want to add this. There is a very special purpose behind these supernatural things. And believe it or not, it is nothing to do with making people feel more special than other people or acquiring secret knowledge. Because look at what the scriptures say. It says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love, I would be nothing. And then again, I read this earlier, Acts chapter 5 says, The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade, and yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. And so here are the two primary reasons why God cares about supernatural things being a normal part of his church when they're used biblically. Number one is because they strategically promote love in his church. And number two, they strategically further the gospel work, the gospel of salvation. And Jesus, when he was here on earth, he made two very important statements. One of them is called the Great Commandment, and basically it says, you got to love God and love people. And the other statement is called the Great Commission, and that one says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The supernatural part of our faith is supposed to be normal because it helps us care about the two things that were most important to Christ, love and the gospel. Therefore, if supernatural things aren't normal, we may need to recalibrate. And so as we close, I want to give us, I want to give you five potential reasons why the supernatural is not currently part of our normal lives. And so number one, maybe you didn't know it was supposed to be normal, but now you do. So you can't use that excuse any longer. Number two, maybe you're lacking in faith. And so faith can impact our experience. Unbelief can limit the supernatural because of their unbelief. And so now if you want to change that, here's one way that you can increase your faith. Romans 10 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ or hearing the word of God. Do what we did today. If you want to increase your faith so that you can experience supernatural power, read your Bible. Number three, you don't pray. As we discussed last week, prayer changes things and many biblical miracles are attached to prayer. And so if you want to experience the supernatural, you got to pray. Number four, maybe you are scared. You know, it's normal to be scared about things that we don't understand. But here's my encouragement. Don't be scared of something that God says is normal. And finally, number five, you don't have access to supernatural power. You know what? You need the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you would like the Holy Spirit in your life today, pray this with me. Father, forgive us for our sins. We have wronged you. We have cared about the things that that you don't care about. And so today we repent and we want to put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so we thank you for the salvation that was won for us on the cross. And we thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. That when we put our faith in you, you change us and you fill us with resurrection power. And so please change us today and let us see your supernatural power. Let us see your glory so that we can love you, so that we can love others, and so that we can go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we pray these things in In Jesus' name, amen.